Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 15th meeting of 2019. Before we move to our first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to switch off mobile phones or put them on silent as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to take further evidence on the Climate Change Emissions Reduction Targets Bill at Stage 2. And this morning, I'm delighted to welcome Chris Stark, the Chief Executive Officer of Climate Change Committee, uh, Pre Professor Keith Bell, Member of the Committee, Professor Pierce Forster, also Member of the Committee, good morning, and David Joffe, the Team Leader for Economy Wide Analysis on the UK Committee for Climate Change. Welcome to you all and thank you for coming and seeing us so quickly after your report was issued, uh, which we've all found uh, very interesting. Um, so I guess what I'll talk about the report and ask you some questions around how you compiled your report. You, you just had six months to compile this report and to research, uh, research it as well, are you confident in that sh relatively short space of time that you have considered all the available options open to the UK and, and, and devolved nations? Uh, good morning and thanks very much for having us. Can I just start by acknowledging the fact that we're horribly undiverse? So, uh, so there's a, there are four, four white men here and I'm very sorry about that, but it doesn't reflect the makeup of the committee. I thought I would start by acknowledging that. Um, yes, I think we are confident. This has been uh, the work, of course, of six or seven months, intensive work to produce um, the recommendations that we have uh, in the report for the Scottish Government and the UK Government. But of course, there's a lot more behind it than that. Um, we've been in training, if you like, for a, for a while, expecting this commission. Um, and there's a number of evidence, uh, pieces of evidence that we're drawing on in this report, not least the work of the IPCC last year, um, and their, you know, landmark report on the, on one and a half degrees. Um, if I if I may, the, the the basis of of the of the of the work is is um, is really the IPCC work, um, a set of um, very in depth uh, reports that we produced last year um, on land use, uh, on biomass, and on hydrogen. Uh, three of three essential components, really, um, of the deep emissions reduction that we have projected in this report. And then there is this body of work that we've managed to put together over the, um, the seven or eight months, actually, since the commission was received from ministers, all of which, when we boil it all up, allows us to say something that we haven't previously been able to say. So we now have a set of scenarios that take us out to 2050, um, and which, which for the first time permit us to talk about this net zero goal. Um, we didn't previously have the evidence base to do that. Um, I am certain that the evidence will get better. Um, over the preceding months and years, but I am very confident with the set of recommendations that we provided to ministers in the report. Um, and as we go forward, I'm sure we'll want to look further at some of the issues that uh, underpin our recommendations. But I think this is genuinely one of the best pieces of work that the committee has ever produced, and uh, and I think will stand the test of time. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned that as you go as you go into the future, there's more in-depth work that you want to do around some of the some of the pathways. Could you maybe outline what's you know, you know, your top your top three years at where your 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 priorities there? Yeah, I mean ne necessarily we've had to do something that looks um, in the main at the UK. Now you'll know. I mean, I've appeared before this committee many times before. You'll know that my I have a certain prejudice that, that we should look very closely at the Scottish issues too, and I think we've done a very good job of that in their support. But I think the main thing to say is that some of the um, uh, pathways to reduce emissions in Scotland will be contingent on things that happen UK wide. Um, we intend to look very closely at some of those things over the course of the next 12 months. Um, the in the UK Act, there is a requirement for us to give advice on the sixth UK carbon budget next year. Um, the basis of that is, you know, there's a huge amount of work in this report that allows us to give a you know a very accurate assessment about the sixth carbon budget um, and the pathways to to achieve the long-term target UK wide. <laughs> that will allow us then to look in much more detail at the um, at the Scottish issues too. And briefly, um, the kind of things that we'll want to look at are, for example, the plan for decarbonising heat, uh, Pan UK, um, how we approach the challenge of carbon capture and storage in the UK, which is such an important thing for Scotland, 
and some of the big issues which frankly are just uncertain at the moment like how do, what is the policy towards land use and agriculture post eu exit if indeed the eu exit happens um so some of these things are, are we can, we've made good and educated guesses about we've made a good assessment of but we'll want to look at in more detail over the next 12 months or so. Well, you've hit upon another area of questioning I want to ask about the equity involved. I mean, obviously, there's a lot um, more challenging targets for, for Scotland to deliver, but a lot of that is dependent on what happens at UK level. Um, I mean, I guess the question is, is it equitable and realistic to, to put you know, these challenging targets at the door of the Scottish Government when, as you say, like decarbonisation of the ga gas network or carbon capture and storage is at UK level? Yeah, I mean, I, I would extend it. It's, this is a global issue. It's not just an issue that the UK will have to deal with. So in the end, the world will have to do something about all of these issues too. So we're, not gonna, we're all going to have to get to net zero or the game's bogey. Um, so I think we can, be, we can be pretty clear that these things will be in place or that the overall mission is going to be off track. And in that basis, I think it is fair at this stage in the climate change bill to give this advice to Scottish ministers to say that set this target, this 2045 net zero target now, and be confident that there will be a UK framework in place to deliver these things. I mean, I might say that in, in, in inserting the, the new target into the bill at this stage, there's a very strong lever over the UK government that, um, that I hope is used as much as possible in the way that the two governments cooperate with each other. I do think it's equitable to do it now. Um, but I do think it's very important that both UK and Scottish policy steps up to the task, and it's not there yet. Can I just, can I just add? Sure. There's an interdependency between Scotland and the UK as a whole in reaching both the targets that we're recommending for Scotland and for the UK. You know, there's a lot of the, uh, you know, the energy sector decarbonisation that needs to go on. That the, it's already the, the UK has benefited from what's happened in Scotland uh, you know the, the development of uh, CCS resource, the, the forestation. You know, it's a, it's a two-way interdependency. So as Chris said, uh, there's, there's strong reason to believe that these. We hope that these recommendations will be will be adopted. Okay, thank um, you. Um, perhaps I can just add to that if you look at the cost analysis we do, there is a cost analysis that does fall disproportionately on S Scotland, we estimate about 13% of the overall c cost of the UK net zero target does fall on this country. Um, so, and, that, and that is much higher than your share of population or GDP. So, 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 so I think within that, there's an op the opportunity to send the rest of the UK quite a big pill for your forestation and for your carbon capture and storage. Um, I have a couple of other members want to come in on that. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I just wanted to briefly pick up on what Chris Stark said. I'm, I very much welcome his confidence in his report. It would be rather depressing when he said something different. Um, but, but, but there was reference to further evidence will emerge. And I just wondered two things in relation to that. Firstly, uh, the implication is the evidence will reinforce the report, I think, from the way it was presented. When do you think it would be appropriate, looking at the evidence you expect to come, to further visit the targets for the UK and for Scotland in the light of that evidence? In other words, what cycle do you think? Because I get the clear implication from that and from my independent reading that the targets we have are with the evidence we have today, but we could in future find ourselves being even more ambitious when's likely to be the right time to come back and have another look at that? Because, of course, there are some pressures to look at different targets right now, which I'm resisting because I want to support what the scientists are saying. So I think this is such an interesting question because I think the hallmark of, what, of the Scottish framework and indeed the UK framework under the Act um, is that when the evidence supports it, we do revisit the targets. And this is the moment, of course, about 10 years after we set that framework in place. Um, 
in response to your question, firstly to say that you know, I, I am, it's difficult to be, to be certain what will happen with evidence in, in, in the future. So we've been prudent and cautious about the way we've approached things like, for example, cost reduction and used a basis on which I think we can be confident um, those your know, costs will, you know, they're in the right mark, they're in the right ballpark. And the second thing to say is that this is not a static position. Um, and in fact, the application of policy has a direct impact on especially cost. And there's a really excellent, I would say that, wouldn't I? There's a really excellent section in this report on, on, on when that happens. You get this very happy kind of feedback loop when policy is, is framed in the right way when markets respond in the right way, you get this remarkable impact on cost. Um, but we have been prudent. We haven't, for example, seen those cost falls in, in, all, in all areas, um, most notably not in nuclear, for example. So I think it's appropriate for us to be prudent and indeed transparent about the way we approach these things. The question of when we might return to it is, is really difficult, but I would say that a period of a decade has been quite useful actually in establishing what happens when you have a framework like this and when policy steps up to address it. And the other thing about that period is that we've had several changes of government over that period uh, here in Scotland and indeed, uh, and indeed at UK level. And that the, the key component of what's of you know the success of the of the Climate Change Act is that it, it should ride out those kind of political shifts. And um, I, I suppose I feel very it is the appropriate time at the moment for us to revisit the for the, the revisit the target. And there may well be a time to look at it again in the future. And the last thing I'll say is we we don't have that much more time uh, to achieve these kind of targets. So the luxury of looking at it when you know we're thinking we may have decades and decades of time. Will will soon 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 evaporate. So I think the, the setting a target like this at this moment is quite a fundamental step. I don't expect that we'll be back revisiting it anytime soon. For example, and one of the one of the kind of strap lines I was using with the team when we were putting this together is that I don't want to be doing this again. This is the kind of moment for us to do as fundamental a piece of work as we can on this, so that parliaments up and down the land can make the right decision. Mark Ruskell in a minute, but just just to pick up on what you've just said there. The methodology around it um, and, and targets is one thing, but pathways is, is quite another. What, what model did you use to come up with the, the, the pathways? Was it time, the Times model again, or was it something different? I mean, I'm past to my colleague David in a second, but no, we haven't used Times, and um, I can speak from experience from using it in the Scottish Government, of course, but um, we, have a, we have a different approach to it, we, we, and indeed we have used Times in the past. But David, do you want to say something about the modelling approach? Sure. So. We didn't use a, a single model to come up with our uh, analysis. We used detailed sectoral analysis and constructed uh, an economy-wide scenario based on modelling in the power sector, buildings, industry, transport, etc., um, so that we could get the greater detail that you can get from, from sectoral approaches, but then we combined them together in a way that made sense across the economy based on insights from doing modelling, not with the Times model, but a similar model, the ESME model that we'd done last year for our hydrogen and biomass report. So we think we have the underpinnings and the insights from that modelling, but we wanted the greatest level of detail possible, and that meant doing sectoral analysis rather than uh, a, a big Times type model. As I understood, I've come relatively late to this process, but, but um, you know, very pleased to be part of it. The priority is to identify that there are credible, affordable pathways, multiple possible pathways. So, you know, there's, there are uncertainties there about some of the kind of uh, further ambition kind of options where you get right down to, to net zero. The fact is that there are options, and that's the kind of most important thing, and to establish from the detailed modelling that they exist. The priority was not, as Times tries to do, to kind of find a single optimal pathway given the data that have fed into it. Right, OK. Mark? You mentioned about uh, interdependency uh, between Scotland and the UK in terms of policy and, you know, one target potentially levering another one. What about the European Union? Because we see a drive now, European Commission wanting to set up an EU target of net zero by 2050. How important is that interrelationship in terms of research, innovation, for example, uh, you know, a EU-wide uh, electricity grid, um, innovation, research? I don't know, is there uncertainty? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not as important as the UK, is the short answer, but it is very important. So some of, the, some, of the, some of the strategies to achieve deep emissions reduction in some sectors do rely on there being a UK, I beg your pardon, an EU approach that's compatible. Think of, um, best example I can think of at the moment is heavy goods vehicles. 
Um, it's very difficult to conceive of a situation where the UK alone, certainly not Scotland alone, could have a, could have a strategy to get HGVs to, to zero carbon without there being some EU-wide approach to that. Um, in, the, in the report, we emphasise the importance of hydrogen, for example. That means that you need really a, a, an EU-wide system of freight management that used hydrogen infrastructure to achieve the kind of outcomes. We, and we look at alternative options too, but um, it's fundamentally an international question. And the other aspect is that um, at the moment, certainly, as members of the EU, we can sit behind some of the big frameworks that, uh, for example, the EU uh, Renewable Energy Framework or Energy Efficiency Frameworks. We need to see what happens after we leave Europe, uh, the European Union, and see how those are replaced. We are, in the main, well ahead of some of the targets in those, in those frameworks, so we haven't really had the opportunity to understand what happens when they start to bite on domestic policy. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's more of a sort of theoretical exercise to consider what might happen in the future. But Europe is, of course, very important. And I'll just make one final point on that, if I may, which is that I think there's another interesting and important relationship between setting a, a domestic target for emissions reduction here in Scotland and the impact that might have on the UK setting a similar target and then the knock-on impact on uh, other countries around Europe. And we, in the report, make a lot of that, that there is a huge uh, and very, I think, underappreciated role in uh, for the, you know, and leverage, if I may, uh, for the UK and Scotland in setting a target like this, which far outweighs the impact in raw emissions terms. So, you know, a, a rich industrialised economy like Scotland, like the UK, setting a target as ambitious and, as this gives a much stronger platform for the EU to actually set the target that has been proposed by the Commission. Um, and I, I can think, in general, we can feel much more confident about the world getting on a better pathway if we if we if we approach it that way. And just to flip it round, the counter, you know, to, the, the counter argument is if we don't do it. Uh, it will be very easy for, for other other parties, especially the EU, not to do it as well. So this is a really critical moment to set a target like this. I think the other thing, two couple of things you mentioned, innovation and uh, electricity. So electricity isn't the whole story. And, you know, Chris has already talked about the hydrogen mm -hmm. sector as being you know, extremely important. But, but electricity remains very, very important. And there's quite a fair amount of electrification of heat and transport is built into what we see as being the kind of credible pathways. And there is an interdependency with the rest of Europe. So, you know, interconnection as a way of balancing out the surpluses and deficits of renewable energy as they vary through through time. For them, for imports of electrical energy to be genuinely low carbon, rather than us for kind of offshoring the, 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 the carbon problem, mm -hmm. does depend on the electricity sector in the rest of Europe decarbonizing. So, you know, in Germany and Poland in particular. So, so again, that kind of leverage, political leverage, is really important in kind of helping to, to move that. Uh, and the innovation bit, I mean, I think that's, you know, extremely important. It, you know, it's clear it, as innovation needs in all sorts of sectors. We've been careful not to make bold assumptions, you know, excessive assumptions about what they're going to deliver. Uh, we're not quite sure. You can never quite predict where the kind of main outcomes are going to are going to arrive. But the, the the capacity. This is something I would feel quite strongly about myself. The capacity to do innovation is is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, so we pointed in the report to the need for investment in, in skills, for example, in, not just in terms of deployment, but also in, yeah, in, in innovation. We could look to the offshore wind sector deal as being you know, an example of something around that, but it's, it shouldn't be seen on its own. There has to be a wider framework for this. Uh, so you know, how the system works as an engineering system across the multiple vectors, and there are still challenges within the electricity system and how it's operated, depends on people with the, with, with the knowledge the, the deep knowledge to go and do that, both within industry, in academia, and consultancies, and so on. So, actually, it's been really disappointing to see that uh, you know there are set, there's a set of centres for doctoral training that are really important UK-wide in, in delivering those people with that that level of skills mm -hmm. and and uh, you know how to do research. There is uh, there were 75 CDTs were announced by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in February. None of them is concerned with the energy system or the electricity system. I think none of them is concerned with, with energy storage. Mm. So I think, you know, there's there's a trick, a serious trick has been missed there. Um, other colleagues, I just want to talk about, um, ask you about the evidence that you got from sectors. We're going to be meeting with a, a few representatives in various sectors who've, you know, been challenged in, in this. Um, when you were taking evidence, um, were there 
any any um, particular sectors that, that were not behind the net zero ambition? And could you maybe outline some of the, the reasons for that? I mean, David, I don't know if you could have got better knowledge of this. I mean, I, I only have, a, I'm afraid, a, 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 you know, a, a summary knowledge of what was responded. And I have to say, most people who responded were advocates for the, right. uh, for, the, for, the for this kind of more, more ambitious target. Um, there were there were a few from memory who didn't, but I have to say I cannot think of a single sectoral representative who argued against it. Okay. Um, there was, however, lots of caution about setting a target that couldn't be met. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's the really important thing for me, is, and that's one of the messages from our report, that this is about much more than a target. Um, it is not credible to have a net zero target unless there is policy to match, and at the moment we don't have that policy. David, David would you, you want, to want to give us that? Perhaps I can speak from my experience as an aviation sector and of the, agri the agricultural one. Um, I do think, th I think as Krista said, they're cautious because they have really big implications for their industries because they're probably the two industries that can't decarbonize completely but, but I th I think they understand that they have to do m m more than they're doing currently so so I think they're not completely against the idea but I am almost a hundred percent certain that they're going to come back to the government and they're going to demand financial support right. of, some, of some kind to be able to get there. Yeah. If I can just add, the, the process for this report, inevitably the input that we got from stakeholders was via the call for evidence and those sorts of things before we'd really done the analysis. What we haven't really had the opportunity to do is then show the analysis to stakeholders before we publish, as we might do if we had more time. So inevitably, stakeholders will have been seeing the analysis for the first time on publication and we would expect them to have reactions to that because of, of course it, it, it's important to their sector so we'll see what the reactions are over the coming weeks and months yeah okay thank you right and move on to questions from claudia beamish thank you convener good morning to the panel and uh, i'd like to look at um your views and um, the evidence from your committee on the appropriate contribution from Scotland in relation to capability, equity and, of course, supporting the global effort. And could I start with a view from yourself, um, Chris, and any other um, uh, panel members who wish to answer about whether, if adopted, the Scottish and UK targets will represent the most ambitious globally? Well, we're very clear in the report that, it, that this is the appropriate contribution to the Paris Agreement, uh, and one of the stipulations of the Paris Agreement is that countries of the world must offer their highest possible ambition. So we go on to define that. Um, I, 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 it's very important to make this point that um, the IPCC has often been cited since we published the report, and, and I, I, regularly I hear that IPCC offered a, you know, an idea that the world should reach net zero by 2050, and therefore this is an unamb unambitious set of recommendations. That, that recommendation for, was for carbon dioxide only. Um, we have offered a recommendation for all greenhouse gases, um, and this is well in advance then of the global average that would be necessary um, for the Paris Agreement temperature goals. Um, we are... We are in every sector straining every sinew if we if we approach a target in this in the way that we've recommended in this report. Um, we have looked at an earlier date for the UK, and necessarily it follows that we've also therefore looked at an earlier date for Scotland. And it's a judgment. I mean, that's why we have the committee, of course, to, the committee here to offer that judgment. But um, any dates prior to 2050 for the UK and prior to 2045 for Scotland carries a huge amount of risk of failure. And I think that it's we can go into more depth in some of the sectoral strategies necessary to get to the 2045 date in Scotland, but there are there are physical and real barriers to achieving it. Um, uh, and those things are not easily fixed, even over a time period of 25 years. So we've, we've looked at a really ambitious strategy overall. We have departed in two ways from the cautious approach that the committee 
has typically offered over its 10 years of, of existence. One is that we are now suggesting to the UK and Scottish governments that we should go ahead of the global average per capita of GHG emissions. We've never done that before. Um, and secondly, and this is true of UK-wide at least, we can't actually get you to net zero. Um, we can get you almost all the way and then we can be confident enough that there'll be a pot of speculative options that will be available to get to net zero. But again, that's a step that's a step in advance of where we've typically been as a cautious committee. I'm very happy to defend that, but I think it's a measure of how hard it was for us to put together a, a, you know, a set of uh, uh, strategies and scenarios for deep emissions reduction in every sector. And that date is as early as we can confidently predict, given all the other factors that we're required to consider as a, as a committee under the Climate Change Act in Scotland. Do you want to add anything to that? Perhaps I can just say some other countries are considering quite similar targets, but, but I think we can say with confidence that the 2045 target for Scotland we set is currently the most ambitious in the whole world, in the country scale, if it is, a, if it is going to be adopted, um, because it, for all greenhouse gases, as Chris said, not just for carbon dioxide, it also considers international aviation and sh shipping as part of its target. And the other thing is, we want to do it as much as possible without international offices sets of some kind. Mm -hmm. So with those considerations, we think it is probably the most ambitious one we currently can set out there. Thank you. And could I ask you how considerations of equity, um, obviously of a, uh, in, in this context of a global um, nature, uh, were factored into the net zero calculations and whether um, directly tackling consumption-based emissions was considered as part of the equation. Um, just for the record, the consumptions-based emissions were estimated to be around 70% higher than territorial-based emissions in 2016, which of course you'll know, but just yeah. for, the, for the record. So yes, we made, a, I, I think, a really uh, transparent and honest appraisal of the equity issues. And, in, and it's worth saying that there are, on some measures, uh, and, and we, we put them very clearly in the report, um, there are some measures that would see the UK adopting an even harder target than that, and it's quite a considerably harder target. And these are UK-wide, I should say. Um, I th in summary, your right to raise consumption emissions is something we worry about a lot. Um, the basis of the statutory framework in the UK is a territorial emissions, um, that doesn't, but that didn't stop us looking at the looking at the issue. Um, the, 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 the problem, I suppose, with consumption emissions is we can't control entirely the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the their, their reduction. The majority of consumption emissions is still what is produced here. It's the first thing to say. Secondly, we know that this is a pure science, this is in fact pure chemistry, never mind science, that if we're going to tackle this issue of global warming, we must, as a globe, get to net zero, and therefore the consumption emissions line will eventually fall. And thirdly, in achieving a domestic net zero goal, whether that's in Scotland or UK-wide, we will reduce our demand for some of the things that push those consumption emission commissions as high as they are at the moment. But in summary, given that we can we consume more than other parts of the world, it is one of the strongest arguments for us to go ahead of the global average um, on that territorial basis and set a net zero um, a net zero target overall. So I, we, we've given, I think, as thorough a description of what can be done about the consumption emissions problem, including the potential to set um, new policies that actively tackle it for example carbon border taxes we explore them in the um, we explore them in the in the report mm -hmm. but this is I, I think it is still appropriate to use the territorial emissions as a basis for target setting given that that is what policy can control directly do you want to add anything to that gents the other thing I'd, I'd add is that calculating consumption emissions is complicated there's a big time lag between the actual the emissions occurring and, and having the data and there are different ways you can do it that will come out with different answers and it, it, it's a less transparent framework to to measure emissions so a, as well as the considerations that chris has set out it, it just becomes much more difficult and much less transparent if you do it that way you know, the international process is you know as chris said it's a global challenge these things have got to be accounted for somewhere 
So if the globe is committed to whatever the Paris Agreement said, these emissions have got to be counted in the kind of global ledger. Um, I just make one advert for the consumption emissions. We were the first report to really calculate these accurately, and they were calculated by Dr. Tan Cohen, who's from my own department, and I do think she really did a fantastic job of doing this. Uh, 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 and I think we can be confident that they will reduce, because if you look at what we're advocating, a policy for the UK about... Sixty percent or so of the levers we want to pull for the UK do focus on demand or, or have at least some element of reducing demand. So, so we can be quite confident that consumption and emissions will also decline going further forward in time. Thank you. And uh, could you please clarify whether the target of net zero by 2045 includes an overshoot scenario or not? Um, I might ask David to say more about this, but no, it, 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 it doesn't, or it's at least minimal overshoot. So we, we, we've we looked at a um, number of ways of achieving the target and concluded that we should be, again, cautious and prudent about that. Is there anything you want to add to that, David? I, I would just say that if we go to net zero greenhouse gas targets, we will in a situation when your country's contrib contribution of temperature change will be de declining f over time. So, so you'll be beginning to reduce your, contrib your contribution to the temperature change. Thank you. And lastly, I uh, could ask you, um, uh, again, whichever of you feel it's appropriate to, to um, contribute, um, why I quote from the report, the rebalancing of effort towards existing climate leaders and richer nations um, appeared, and I quote, more plausible than uh, increasing the effort of middle income and developing countries. Just for the record, please. So uh, this is one of the most important aspects of this report. So we've been let loose to look at a set of global issues that we wouldn't typically be, to be able to look at. And there's a, there's a great deal of new work in here that you, you won't find in any other report. And one of the really good contributions, I think, that we are making now to the global discussion is that we have we've tried to model a different sort of scenario, which is much more in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement where the richer developed countries go first and take a lead. Um, the reason for that is because they're able to do so and they can afford it. And there's a great service in them doing so. And we've been doing that here in Scotland and in the UK very well for the last 10 years. One of the best expressions of why it's important for us to do this, never mind the fact that we have a relatively small po um, proportion of global emissions, is that we've been successfully with policy bringing down the costs of some of the key technologies. And that has, that's a service, frankly, that, it, that other countries will then benefit from. It, it is most obvious uh, in Scotland when we look at the offshore wind story, but there are other technologies too. And it's by, it's by supporting those technologies, deploying them and bringing those costs down, that we can feel more and more confident about the cost of those technologies coming beneath fossil fuels globally so that those countries that are still developing may never need to use fossil fuels and may never need to build the infrastructure and that is essential, frankly, in achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. So I think there's a, it's a really important thing in this document that we look at those global concerns and model something that is more credible overall. Um, that's something I hope that other countries around the world, and indeed the UN itself, um, pays attention to. And there's economic, economic opportunity in there as well. You know, there's, there's the, the pioneers of the technology are going to be able to export that expertise and that technology. Absolutely. Yeah, no, this is one of these. This is one of these things that we can be we can be confident will be addressed in other countries. So, we, so everyone must reach net zero. That's been my stock stock answer to some of these questions so far. But in, in the knowledge that that is the case, the developing some of the technologies to do it here in Scotland is a very sensible economic development strategy. And I suppose the other thing to say about that is that the record of the last decade and more is that having had the Climate Change Act in Scotland, and again at UK level. We haven't ruined the economy, quite the opposite. We have become um, a, you know, a very strong, uh, very strong example of what happens when policy is framed in the right way. The economy has grown uh, while we've successfully cut emissions. 
And that is exactly what needs to happen in every developed country as a demonstration of how we can achieve it overall. And I, I, I'm confident it can be done, actually, if, if other countries follow this kind of framework. Okay. Mark Ruskell, follow-up questions on this theme? Yeah. Um, the, the big take-home message from um, the IPCC report was that we need to take action in the next 10 years. Uh, that early action is absolutely critical. Um, so I'm wondering what kind of research and analysis you've done around the 2030 target. There's much more about what we do now, what we put in place now, today. So I'm, I, again, I might open this up in a second, but just by way of introductory comment. So we've, we have necessarily had to look at a UK-wide strategy for net zero and drawn some conclusions about how, to, how, how that effort can be achieved in Scotland and indeed in Wales uh, and Northern Ireland for that matter. Um, what we haven't been able to do is to build a detailed pathway here in Scotland yet. And um, that's something we acknowledge in the report and that we intend to do something about over the course of the next 12 months or so, 12 to 18 months. Um, that has meant that we've been, I think, prudent again and cautious in how to assess the need for the, that as the very sensible and important need for interim targets under the new climate change bill in Scotland. Um, and we've, we've used the best evidence we have of what the pathway might look like to get to that 2045 date that has been a straight line assessment. Um, I think we will revisit this. I don't know whether that means that we'll revisit the 2030 interim target, but I know that we'll have better evidence on which to base our assessment when we do so. That, again, the key component of our ability to assess the interim targets, especially in 2030, will be the assessment that we make of the UK's sixth carbon budget overall and the pathways to achieve hopefully a tougher target if Westminster follow Holyrood's example. But you are absolutely right to make reference to the importance of short-term action. Um, this is uh, a, an issue overall globally where uh, especially long-lived gases, long-lived gases, um, as they are emitted, add to the global stock of CO2, which is the, after all what global warming is all about. And the more that we can cut that in the short term, the better the impact on global warming overall. So you can be assured that this committee's interest is in seeing as much action as possible over the, you know, it's frankly as soon as possible to deliver these goals. Um, and that's something I think we'll want to look at in more detail when we have the evidence to do it. Do you want to add something to that, Piers? Um, yeah, but as Chris said, we don't go into detail about what the, to do for in this next 10 year time frame, but, but there are some definite key thing to come out of the report. The, f the first thing is we want to bring, f bring f forward the data of EV cars, where we want to, the government to pan petrol and diesel cars from that 2030 time period. Um, and the other thing, we, we want to develop this carbon capture and storage clusters, mm -hmm. uh, and we have to develop them in the next five year time frame, sort of thing. Uh, and the third thing I want to say is that we have to get, we have to change our A forestation target immediately and we have to get planting the trees because they take time to grow of course and they take time to suck that carbon from the atmosphere uh, uh, and we recommend for S S Scotland that the current forest cover of around 20% ought to be rapidly increased to 30% mm -hmm. of the coverage. If I can just add on. In terms of what, what, what needs to be done, um, the, with only around 25 years to get to net zero, some of the things that we're going to need in terms of infrastructure are going to need early action. So it's not just the, the CCS, though that is crucially important. If we're going to be using hydrogen, then infrastructure for, for both the, the hydrogen production and hydrogen supply is going to be important, electricity grids, but also on the, on the softer side, public engagement and uh, the skill side of things to make sure that actually over the following two decades, we're, we're, we're actually in yeah. a place to be able to yeah. deliver this. I think, I was going to say, I think the infrastructure question is a really challenging for policy making yeah. 
a lot of the infrastructure that we've had, certainly in, well, in respect to transport and energy, uh, was developed you know, actually quite a while ago um, under a completely different market or, or financing arrangements to what we have now. To develop you know, a hydrogen and carbon capture and storage infrastructure, uh, what really is the right framework within which to do that? You know, can, you know, it's not, it's, it's no longer, well, the electricity and gas sector is sort of incremental, albeit big increments to accommodate uh, repurposing of the gas grid or uh, electrification of at least some part of heat and transport. But starting from scratch, where you need something you know, pretty pretty big, yeah, what are the policy levers to it to enable that, and how is that going to be financed and delivered? That has to be decided really yeah. quickly. I mean, I appreciate there are some there there are some big questions there, and there are some, as you put it in your report, some speculative, um, you know, ways to to meet the emissions. But we are talking about the next ten years here, and it seems very odd that you've effectively just drawn a straight line. So let's look at the the increase in effort that would be required for 2030 if we were to adopt your target, it represents 4%, so an increase from 66 up to 70%. What, what, what do you think is going to fill that gap? And, Look, and let's, do, do you let's, think there are areas where, in your previous advice and current advice, we could be ramping up ambition to go a bit further than 70%? And I mean, in the report, we acknowledge that that is indeed, lines, absolutely, so. and we acknowledge in the report that 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 it's perfectly possible to go faster at some of these things, and indeed that will make it easier overall to achieve the net zero target. Let's just list the things that need to happen. So we're talking about an utterly incredible increase in electricity production, and not incredible, I'm going to rephrase that, an, 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 an amazing increase in, in, in electricity production yeah, from low carbon years, means yeah. over the next 10 right, years. Okay. Um, that needs to be ramped up. The policies are there, the policies are there to deliver that, but it needs the appropriate kind of ambition to deliver it. And in the report, we reflect on the, the UK government strategy for having 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Were that to be increased, were we to go faster at the questions of electrification from some of the key technologies, then we might be able to get ourselves on a, on a different kind of trajectory. It would certainly reduce some of the risks of achieving net zero right. overall. So higher, so steeper than the straight line? Yes. I mean, I think the point is we, we, have not, we, we don't have the data on which to base Right. You know, a more detailed pathway yet for Scotland, and that I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but it's best that I acknowledge it, because it, it involves us understanding first what the UK-wide position looks like, mm -hmm. and then understanding what share of that Scotland can take. But that electrification strategy is one of the things you can go faster at. We have mentioned the EV switchover date. Um, it is indefensible to have a UK-wide uh, switchover date of 2040. We know that that is incompatible with yeah, the 80% target, never mind a net zero target. Uh, a car bought in 2040 that is still using fossil fuels will still be on the roads 15 years later. And in the report, one of the best bits of analysis is that we show that it's a boon to the economy to do it. And indeed, it's a boon to the economy to bring them forward the switch over date as soon as, as soon as, uh, to as an early date as possible, yeah. preferably 2030. Agriculture um, and land use. Agriculture and land use. We have, to, we have to start planting trees. It's very obvious. You know, this is a, that involves us changing our approach to agriculture overall. Uh, again, we have been cautious about the kind of things that need to be done, but we need to free up agricultural land for natural stores of carbon. There is a, you know, that takes time. Um, and we've already discussed carbon capture and storage and the related issue of, of hydrogen. If that's to play a meaningful role in the way that we think it should over the next 25 years, the sooner we get started on that, the better. This is one of those areas where I think we do need a genuinely integrated approach between the Scottish and, and UK governments, that the, sort of, sort of the likes of which we haven't had uh, over the last 10 years. If those things are put in place, if they happen sooner, um, then we can be more confident overall about achieving a net zero target. And it may be that we can come back to look at the date. Um, but at the moment, the best assessment we can make of how quickly one can do this is in this report. And that 2030 interim date is something that we, of course, will look at once we have a better understanding of the UK pathway more, I mean, more I think generally. You perhaps understand the difficulty that we've got. We've got a bill before us. Um, it'll be through, you know, stage three and and, and through in, in, into law by the end of this year. Um, are we then to wait another two years for you to have more certainty in order for us to set a 2030 target? Because you know, let's go back to the IPCC. They're saying 10 years tops. So we're now on to eight years. So the, you know, the time's running out. I mean, we need to make decisions now on what that realistic 2030 target should be. So we've offered you the best assessment of what we think is achievable in Scotland. We haven't been able to offer you the detailed pathway that might inform a different 2030 target. That doesn't mean we won't come back to it. I'm not asking you to wait, no. I'm asking you to take the advice that we offered in this report, which is very, very ambitious. 
um, if the UK-wide frameworks and let's not let the Scottish Government off the hook here. There's a set of things that can be done in Scotland too, most notably around agriculture and the built environment, so housing. If those things are stacked up and if we see that happen over the next 12 months, then I think we can indeed be more ambitious about the interim targets. And I, I'll just go back to my earlier point. It matters immensely what happens over the next 10 years. This is something the committee, of course, cares deeply about. So you can expect us to look at that, David. If I can add, I think it's really important to distinguish between what are the actions we can take over the next 10 years and what will that mean for emissions in 2030? We have a clear idea of what the set of actions that need to happen over the next 10 years now, and we've set some of those out. What we don't have is exactly what that means for emissions in 2030 because we haven't been able to do that analysis. But the priority now should be putting in place the policies to reduce those emissions rather than working out exactly what the numbers should be and then targeting exactly that number. We know we need to get to net zero by 2045, mm -hmm. and there's a set of things that we'll need to do to get there. Precisely what the emissions reduction needs to be by 2030 on the, on the way there, we think is less important than simply putting in place the policies to make sure that we can get all the way to net zero. Um, so it's, w that's why we focused on the endpoint and on what are the actions required rather than specifically on the percentage reduction, though we, we will try to do more mm -hmm. and more accurate analysis than that straight line mm -hmm. in future. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got a lot of ground to cover and apologies to uh, colleagues who want a supplementary question. Maybe you can wait until I, I come to you for your main line of questioning. Uh, move on to questions from Morris Golden. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wonder if the panel can reflect on changes uh, to the emission inventory and specifically uh, around the global warming uh, potential methodology, methodologies as well as the inclusion of peat. Um, again, I'll turn to David in a second um, on the way that we've approached this, but just to say that our general approach was to be, to be cautious again about those changes. So um, we knew they were coming. Uh, we know that, that that some of the emissions inventory changes impact in Scotland in a in a in a uh, in a greater proportional way than than the, the whole of the UK, and some of them are very big, especially things like peatland revisions. Um, the the advice that we've offered overall is offered on the basis that that, that, that there is the maximum impact on the emissions inventory that, that so, so that we are being uh, you know conservative in the right way about how to assess this. It may be that um, the, those global warming potentials and that the peatland revisions come in at a lower level, in which case the targets overall would be easier to meet. And that's something that we've accommodated in our, in our assessment. David? Yes, I mean, ju just to echo what Chris said, we, we've tried to be conservative. I think it, we had the option of making recommendations on the basis of the existing inventory, but clearly if we'd recommended a net zero target that was more ambitious than where we, what we've ended up recommending, and then we have to say in three years' time when the inventory changes, sorry, you can't meet it anymore, that would be quite damaging to, to competence in the, in the Act. So we, we, we're very careful to be conservative and, and we have confidence that this target can be met with any known, known changes that are forthcoming to the inventory. Clearly, there may be things that come down the line in the 2020s or the 2030s that we haven't anticipated, but given known changes, we're, we're confident it can be met. Yeah, I mean, just to give you some idea, of their significance. I mean, the, it, it, if you were to make the change today, they could in, increase your mm, emissions by about 15% or that sort of order of magnitude. So, so that it also gets to your particular point about it's quite hard, depending on how the change will go, to try and set a precise 2030 target and I think my advice for that would, would be you have to really make sure which of the kind of baseline that you compare your target to in, in fact so which of the kind of peatland mm, 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 missions you compare it to and what are the GWPs you can choose for your particular target so I think you have to have some continuity there. Um, uh, well, but they, they have a big effect today, but then hope, hopefully when you, when you begin to do lots of peatland restoration uh, and you also reduce your mission from agriculture, by the time you get to the 
1945 period, they oughtn't to be so significant. So it 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 will have a big effect on the inventories if you change them today, but they do not have such a big effect when you go further forward in time. Okay. Thank you. Um, Stuart? Um, I was going to ask about peat later, but it's come up now. Um, the, the baseline for peat is presumably the 1990, oblique 95, I think 1990 baseline. So the, the change of the methodology is presumably incorporating the, what has happened since 1990 to the present time, which we acknowledge is not very helpful. But in terms of what's happening in peatland restoration, um, my own experience tells me the environmental restoration ra ha seems to happen extremely rapidly in the peatland, the, the diversity and so on and so forth. But what sort of uh, impact in terms of starting to reduce, in particular, methane emissions and indeed absorb greenhouse gases, what, what does the graph look like for that for peatland as we move forward? Because it's all very well talking about peatland restoration, but but uh, it, it, it's currently being done for environmental reasons as much as climate change. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. okay, it's it's. Too, I mean, a very simple thing you can do is lock up the drainage, so you yep, don't yep. have so much rain from your peatland. But just doing that one simple thing, in fact, does almost instantly reduce the emissions of methane that you do you do get from the kind of peat and things uh, 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 and uh, 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 but, but the sequestration of carbon dioxide to take more time I mean peatland does take them thousands of years Years to uh, to uh, to uh, to eventually regenerate. So so, yeah. so so just to be clear, then the peatland uh, restoration uh, and I've seen yeah. examples of blockage of drain how quickly mm. that works. Um, that reduces the emissions, but given that it's going to take a lot longer for the peatland to start to absorb CO two. Is it the most effective land intervention for absorbing CO2, or are we back to uh, forestry as the much more effective and quicker way of absorbing CO2? Or is there another? I mean, we'll talk about land. I don't want to open that up too much at the moment. Um, or are there other interventions on land that are just going to be more effective? Since we've got to prioritise what works best, fastest. It, 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 no, it, I would say that it is still a very effective very effective form about reducing emission and sequestration. And, and I think one good thing about it is that it, 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 we're talking about not very big areas. So, so, so if you look at the amount of the land surface of the UK and Scotland that we're talking about, that is not a very big area, so so that means you can really concentrate your policies on the relatively tiny areas, and and if you're talking about target of a forestation, you 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 really have to engage with many more land owners throughout the country and with the towns and the cities and the parks and all the communities and so it is a much more difficult logistical challenge so that's why if you delve into the detail of the land use report we published in December we think it's a really effective way of doing it still. If I can just add, add. While I completely understand where you're coming from in terms of where is the priority, is it here or is it here, actually the, the magnitude of the challenge we have now in getting to net zero by 2045 means we need to do the afforestation and the peatland restoration oh, yes. and, and, and. Oh, yes. but, but nevertheless, I understand where you're coming from in terms of priorities. 
Angus MacDonald. Thanks, um, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, just on that point, it's worth pointing out that uh, hailing from the Isle of Lewis, uh, I've seen trees planted on peatland 40 years ago, and they're no higher than this desk, so there's, there's numbers. Uh, there's certainly challenges there as well. Um, if we could look further at the, the, the challenges in uh, realising net zero, um, you've the, the panel's touched on this earlier in response to, to some of Mark Ruskell's questions, but with regard to the further ambition of electricity generation, what challenges are there to increasing renewable generation to four times today's levels? This is definitely one for Keith, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the major things is getting the supply chain going and the finance going. So uh, we have a situation at the moment where uh, contracts for difference, which help to kind of manage the risk of the variability of the wholesale price, are only being offered for, well, okay, we'll see what happens in terms of kind of less developed technologies, but for the more mature technologies, only for, for offshore, uh, whether that be kind of, you know, in the middle of the sea or actually uh, island-based, so, you know, in the Isle of Lewis, I guess that will be a big topic of interest for you. It needs to, well, the financing for onshore wind also remains very important. For me, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty about whether merchant development of onshore wind is really going to happen in the short term or the medium term. I talked to some people who seem to be reasonably confident of developing the, the power purchase agreements to, to underpin those investments. Other people are talked to say, no, no, there's no way. It's, not, it's just not going to happen. What we say in the report is some sort of financing mechanism is necessary for onshore wind and we also need, we also need further development of, of solar PV. There's also a, a kind of a, a, a network investment question. So accommodating those new developments of generation where they are, uh, but also we've seen, we've talked about it already, electrification of, of demand, uh, of, of, of heat and transport, which will, which will grow the electricity demand, something that hasn't happened in this country for, for years. So that also has to be yeah, facilitated by the network investment at the right time. And that's something we say in the report about timely investment. Uh, there's a regulatory kind of role in this. The network companies are putting together, so the distribute at the transmission level right now, putting together their investment plans for the period, I think it's uh, 2021 to 2026. Uh, the amount of money that they are allowed by the regulator is going to be really important in how that gets delivered. Some of that growth in demand we would expect to come through during that period. The distribution plans will be coming uh, the, you know, the year after that uh, for, again, a five-year period. Up to now, the regulator has been very worried about stranded assets, overinvestment, the risk that things are put in that turn out not to be needed. Given what we are saying about the pathways to electrification of heat and transport, uh, and I think, I'm a personal opinion, an over-concern with stranded assets would not be helpful in terms of managing the total cost of facilitating yeah, electrification of heat and transport. Okay, and um, moving on slightly, we, we, we know the uh, Scottish Government's position on, on nuclear energy, but what role does uh, new nuclear play in the CCC's scenarios? Um, were, were current difficulties with deploying new nuclear factored into uh, planning? So I, 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 David might want to come in on this, but the um, so we we need a, an electric system system that works. Um, that necessarily is a mixture of things. Um, now renewable energy, renewable electricity production has been proving itself to be very you know very useful addition to the energy system overall here in Scotland and in the UK. Um, there are, however, <coughs> limits to how far you can go unless it's it's paired up with other technologies. And in the report, we explore that. In fact, there's a whole document that we published alongside it that looks at the question of intermittency, which is often one of the key challenges that's viewed. We, we've, again, this is one of these areas where we've been cautious. We're assuming that um, we get a kind of 60% penetration of renewables in the future. It will be, I think, perfectly possible to go further than that, but we've assumed 60. Um, and then there is this mixture of things that go alongside that to provide the kind of flexibility that would be needed to manage renewables at that kind of penetration. That would include either firm nuclear power or firm carbon capture and storage. Um, and we don't make an assessment of what you know the choice between those two things, because in the end, it's the market that should deliver that outcome. But nuclear may well have a role, 
but it needs to do so at a price that the market can deliver. And uh, I suppose the best way to summarise our position on these things is that the committee is um, uh, is agnostic about technology, but not about that, not about the price at which it's developed. And that you know that's the that will be the key challenge. If nuclear is to play a meaningful part in the mix by 2050, it's going to have to do so in competition with other technologies. And uh, I think there's a really good and cautious assessment of, of how that could play out in the future. David? Just to add, uh, uh, it's, it, it's important to recognise that our approach prioritised looking at how low could emissions go rather than the precise mix of technologies that would be required. So clearly you can do it with a different mix of technologies than we have assumed. You get to very similar levels of emissions. It might be more expensive, it might be slightly less expensive. Um, that wasn't our primary focus. Our primary focus was how low can emissions go and on what time scale. And clearly you could have more or less nuclear than we have assumed. And that might still get you to the same level of emissions uh, as long as you uh, you have a mix of technologies that, that can give you that emissions reduction. I think we need to get the policies right in terms of enabling the right kind of capability. So the market left to its own devices in terms of uh, schedulable generation, you know, stuff that you can plan days, weeks in advance, uh, at the moment just delivers unabated carbon, uh, combined cycle gas turbines. That's not going to be acceptable at all from, from very soon, actually, given the lifetime of this sort of plant. So what are the, the instruments by which we ensure that we get the right kind of capability? We're, not, we're agnostic about exactly the technology that's used, but its service to the, to the system has to be enabled. So we have a capacity market right now, for example, which contributes towards meeting the cost of developing uh, new, new generation and keeping existing generation open. Uh, but it's pretty crude in what it commissions. It's just sort of the total for the system somewhere. It doesn't currently think about its ability to flex, you know, this kind of mid-merit type of plant to kind of help to manage the intermittency. And it doesn't currently think about exactly where it is on the system. Uh, so, you know, in terms of security of supply in Scotland, for example, that, that sort of thing becomes really important. Uh, so there is a review going on at the moment in bays of how the capacity market works. It's in abeyance at the moment anyway. We assume it will come back at some point. But kind of, yeah, what features it has to enable the right technical characteristics is going to be really important. Okay, thanks. Um, moving on to uh, low carbon heating. Um, what challenges... Sorry, did Stuart Stevenson want to come in on? If, if possible, if, if convenient. Very, very yeah. brief. Um, Conscious of time. Ofgen's network pricing strategy, of course, uh, discriminates against distant generators who are distant from consumption. And given that renewable is rarely on the doorstep of our major cities, isn't it time for us having a pricing strategy for the network that actually relates to the climate change efficiency of the generation process rather than it being based on the distance that the generation is from the consumption point? I guess this is a level of detail that uh, the CCC hasn't gone into for the net zero report. It happens to be something I worked on myself a few years ago. Uh, I think my view is that the, uh, the interest of society is served by, by two things. One, that they have affordable access to electrical energy. Two, that we decarbonise the electricity system and that contributes to the, the overall picture that the CCC has, has set out. The minimum cost bit, you know, well, affordability can be you know, related very strongly to a minimum total cost of the energy. Uh, that means that the right technologies have to be developed in the right places in terms of their cost. So there are clearly trade-offs. You know, you, if you're going to build a wind farm, you want to look at where it's uh, where you can get the most wind, uh, get the most energy for the <coughs> unit inv investment cost. But there's also a cost of the network to accommodate it. I think what's important is that the signals are given to uh, the investors to make rational choices, given all of the variables. I think it's really hard to intervene, or try to intervene, by playing games with the detail of various industry mechanisms, other than to set, at the, at the highest level, this is what the system needs, and this is what society needs in terms of decarbonisation. So uh, we have to develop wind, or offshore and onshore, that has a cost. We've seen, you know, Chris has already mentioned those costs have come down because we've given them support over the last 10 years. Uh, the market will have to make sure that the investment 
is covered, that the investors do come forward with a, with a, a business plan that works, that will include the cost of the network to accommodate it. The network signals have the pricing signals have to incentivize the minimum total cost. So, um, and you know those those signals are really important not just for the development of, of generation, but also for how we accommodate demand and what choices users of energy can make. This is going to be really hard, actually. You know, do you build the network, electricity network, to accommodate, you know, his and hers fast charging Teslas simultaneously? Or do you say, well, actually, you don't have to fast charge, not simultaneously. When do you need it? Well, you could do it, you know, when the, when it's windy or when it's sunny. You don't have to do it just any time. Sorry, do you think, do you think but, I mean, in essence, at the moment, we're paying Drax to feed Manchester and penalising renewable energy in more distant areas. It's about, as an it's about, it's about signalling what the cost of the network is to yeah. developments in different places. Yeah. You can argue, and I think many people would argue, about the accuracy of those signals, but I, I still believe, in terms of the overall affordability of energy, giving signals to what the costs are and informing rational choices by investors is really important. Yes. Thanks. Um, I'm conscious of time pressures, convener, so I'll, I'll try and cram in uh, a couple of questions. Uh, going back to uh, low carbon heating, um, what challenges are there uh, to increasing low carbon heating from 4.5% today to 90% uh, by 2050, and uh, is there an opportunity, for example, to uh, accelerate action uh, to decarbonise the gas grid and consider the balance of taxis across different heating fuels to enable affordable low-carbon heating in homes and businesses across Scotland? Right. Heating. Um, if there is a test of whether we're serious, it's heating. We have an extraordinarily useful energy system delivering heat to every home in Scotland and the UK at the moment. It works extremely well, but sadly it's based on fossil fuels in the main. It is not going to be easy to change that, but it is necessary that we do so. So the targets that we have at the moment require that, and the and net zero target just makes it even more obvious that that needs to be done. We do not have a strategy across the UK that will deliver a decarbonised heat system. There are big choices to be made about how to do it. Um, and the key message, I suppose, from the committee to governments here in, the U in Scotland and in the UK is you have no excuse to make that but, but to make that plan now. Um, it is essential that that happens. Um, that doesn't mean that we need to see exactly the detail of what the system looks like in 2050, but it does mean that there, ha there has to be a clear commitment now from especially the UK government, which holds most of the policy levers here, to a fully decarbonised heat system um, by, you know, at the latest 2050 and preferably before that. Um, the key choices are, what do we do with the gas grid? You know, we are in the main a country that still uses gas. It's an extraordinarily useful thing. We do have a choice here. We can use hydrogen as an alternative to that. It's not, it's not a case of flicking the switch to achieve that outcome. In this report, we lean very heavily on electricity as a basis for heat, using things like heat pumps. Um, it's perfectly possible to have a mixture of outcomes here that, you know, for example, the hydrogen question and the, and, and the heat pump question in combination. Um, and there are even other, t other alternatives that could get us there. Um, what, this is one of the key issues that I expect us to look at in more detail in the committee over the coming, over the coming years. But I would really like to see a strategy UK-wide for domestic heat now. We've said in this report that that strategy needs to be formed by uh, 2020. Uh, there, you may know that there is already... Uh, a plan for um, the UK departments and Treasury and in Bays to put together a plan, especially to consider what happens after we close the renewable heat incentive. That's not enough. This has to be a comprehensive plan overall. Um, and one of the key components of that plan is to address one of the things that you raised, Mr McDonald, in your question, that is, there, is, uh, there is an inbuilt penalty to the use of electricity in the system at the moment and an, an inbuilt incentive to use gas. Um, that's a very sensible policy or has been a very sensible policy for a long time on the basis of fuel poverty um, but it's not a very sensible policy for climate change so I would like to see that strategic question of how we address the imbalance uh, as one of the key components of the review that we've recommended the Treasury makes and there are the policies there to deliver a different outcome but it must also consider those regressive impacts on vulnerable consumers too there's no easy answer here, but this, and indeed, it's one of the major costs in achieving net zero, but it needs to be addressed. Um. Perhaps I could just say to that, I think S Scotland can set a good example for the rest of the UK, and compared to the rest of the UK, a lot of the homes in Scotland are not on the 
task cleared. So with those homes that aren't on the cash cleaning plan, it's even more of a cost, cost incentive there to go over to electricity with those kind of homes as fast as possible. So they ought to be really the first adopters of really trying to put in this new technology. So I think if if it gets to your point, Mr. Rascal, about the next 10 year time frame here. I think there's an opportunity to really go after those off the gas grid parts of the country with the first 10 years. I think, I think there's another important thing which we're behind on, really, which is the evidence to inform the kind of heat strategy. Part of the heat strategy should, I think, there should be a degree of flexibility there because exactly what's the right option, I think, depends on where you're starting from, you know, in terms of location and what the resources are. You know, for example, someone is on the gas grid or is, or is not on the gas grid and the density of demand. Uh, but the evidence is lacking, I think. You know, we, we're only now getting trials going to sort of test out, you know, kind of how people would respond and be able to interact with uh, hydrogen-based appliances for example, and how people understand and use air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps. You, know, you heat your, your, your home in a, in a different way. One thing that I, I think is, is uh, really important that, that, that very often it's, it's uh, you know, state money through, for example, UK research and investment or, or through the Scottish Government uh, makes sure is that the evidence that comes out of the trials is clear. Uh, as there have been too many of these trials. I think there was a report that was published uh, not long ago by the UK Energy Research Centre that looked into energy system demonstrators and trials going on since 2008. Uh, the reporting of them has been poor. Some, some of these projects, no reports at all. The whole idea is we get evidence to inform what policy is, what works and what the challenges are that still need to be met. So um, this is, a, I think, an element of innovation policy that's been really lacking. It's actually to make sure we do capture the learning and disseminate it properly. And uh, as I said, we're already behind on this, given the, uh, the urgency, as Chris said, of getting a heat strategy in place. Okay. I'm, I'm sure Final we, question, if that's I'm, okay. I'm sure we all uh, will we'll follow that uh, and look for quick progress in the, in, in the near future. Um, just using off-grid as, as an example, um, would you say, but not just off-grid, would, would you say the general public are ready for net zero? And how can a positive public discourse be built, uh, particularly with hard to reach individuals and communities? So all of the evidence suggests the public want net zero, at least in the majority. Um, the, the, there is a, a, you know, we explain in the report that to get to net zero, we need to do something that we haven't done in the last 10 to 15 years, at least, which is to properly engage citizens of the country and how we achieve it. I don't think there's anything to be afraid of in that, but it does mean that there will be shifts in behaviour, shifts in societal choices that help underpin that. One of them is this question of heat, for example. So, we, you know, where are we to be heating our homes from <clears throat> things like heat pumps? It works extremely well, but it involves interacting with your home energy system in a different way. I would like to see us begin properly to tackle that issue. We cannot keep doing what we've been doing for the last 10 years, which is very successfully decarbonising electricity production. Um, and expect that that will get us all the way. Uh, it, it happens to be that um, you know last year more than half of the electricity supplied to UK homes was low carbon, but most people haven't noticed that. You know that that's been a remarkable success of policy. Um, the stuff that comes next does involve different types of behaviour and needs to be explored properly with real people, um, uh, or we won't be successful. And the whole thing will go off track, frankly, if we're not managing it that way. The final point on this is that I don't think that that means that we need to engage everyone in the task of climate change action, although you know I'm sure that's something that we'll want to do as as uh, as we go along. Um, some of the things that need to happen if you're using your you know a smarter home energy system or a smarter you know, charging system for your car, for example, don't necessarily have to be seen as climate change measures. So this is about really engaging people in the kind of new technologies and new uses of technologies that will come along in a positive discourse, as you say to keep the overall mission on track. Um, and we need to get on and do that as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you. I want to say that you know, some worries about whether people will be able to adapt their behaviour. It all seemed a bit worrying. Oh, we have to do things differently. Actually, I'm, I tend to be a bit op more optimistic on that. You know, we can look at how people are using electric vehicles. Okay, there's not that many of them yet, but 
you know, the feedback is often really positive. You know, they get used to doing things in a different way uh, and really like a lot of the features that come through. So I think there's, uh, there's a lot to be hopeful about, I think, in terms of the sort of public engagement, if we kind of keep this momentum going. Uh, I guess the other elephant in the room, and that's land use, uh, Finlay Carson. And before I go, I go to Finlay Carson, can I ask my colleagues to look at the questions that you want to ask and just check that it hasn't already been covered because we are running out of time? Finlay Carson. Good morning. Yeah, the thorny subject of agriculture, and I, I declare an interest as a member of the NFU and also a former dairy and beef farmer. Um, it suggested that more ambitious uptake of existing measures is needed alongside improvements to uh, livestock breeding and uh, diets. So how should the government ensure that a more ambitious uptake of existing measures t are adopted? So it starts with actually having the honest discussion about it and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that we haven't quite got to that yet. So um, I, mean, I might say this, that th there seems to be more of an open discussion at the moment at, in Westminster about some of these issues than there is in Scotland and perhaps I'm uh, you know, perhaps that's not the case but it's, it certainly seems that way to me and in particular Michael Gove's interest in public money for public goods. So this idea that there are a set of services that the land delivers, amongst them is food production, but there are others too, including biodiversity and carbon sequestration. Um, the agriculture community understands climate change better than any other community. They can see the change in growing seasons that's coming. Um, I would love to see us engage them properly, not regard them as the enemy, which is sometimes how, how some of these discussions are pitched. There are real emissions from agriculture. Um, it, some of those emissions are perfectly manageable and that community, if engaged properly, I think can be a real part of the solution to get us to those deep emissions reductions that are necessary for net zero and they should expect to be recompensed for that. Um, but we will need to broaden the set of incentives that are provided for agriculture beyond food production to achieve that. And in this report, drawing on the work that we did last year on land use, we are actually advocating a set of um, measures that free up agricultural land to help in the process of, of storing carbon more actively. That's about forestry, peatland restoration and possibly bioenergy crops in the future as well. Okay, just on that, do, do you believe in a move to a multifunctional land use scenario, whether that's voluntary or otherwise, which would look at specific areas, so soil types, uh, soil designations, land, um, different land use, should that be a looked at should we move to that sort of scenario yes okay nice and simple question now the, ne the next one might not be quite so it's straightforward there's a suggestion that uh, we should reduce meat consumption by 50 percent now uh, currently I would suggest that would decimate the agricultural industry particularly in Scotland has there any thought been given to the rate we could expect culture change or behavior change um, and and the potential for displacement of meat production. Um, so the impact of potentially more of the meat that's eaten in Scotland being produced elsewhere in the world with a, a bigger impact on, on the climate. Just to clarify the point, in, in our scenarios we actually model a, a, a societal shift where we are consuming 20% less red meat and dairy in amongst a set of speculative options to get us all the way UK-wide to, to net zero, we do consider that one of the things you could look at is is, 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 is a bigger shift in diet. It's not something we're advocating, we're seeing it's there as a potential option. I happen to believe that a 20% cut in consumption of red meat and dairy is a relatively conservative um, assessment. When you look at just the changes in diet between younger generation and older generation, that's broadly in line with that. Um, it's worth knowing that we looked at some of the public health guidance um, out there. It's nothing to do with climate change. Um, public Health England produced a really um, uh, good assessment of how your diet needs to shift if you wish to be if you, if, if you were to be healthier. The implication of that is an 86% cut in red meat and dairy. Um, that was a bit racy for us. So, uh, so uh, what we've gone with is a 20% cut instead, which. Had, which rather than having a policy for that, looks very much like it's broadly in line with social trends and therefore doesn't see us importing lots of meat. And the key point, I'll make it, make it again, is that, that that frees up land to do a broader set of things to, for the land to provide a different set of, of, of services. And as long as, as the agriculture community, the owners of those land, that land is, is recompensed to do those different things, it's a profession like any other. I don't see why we couldn't achieve something like that. Okay. Um, yeah. I think just to... Just to come on that too, I, I, I do, do, do think we aren't going to get to net zero without taking the agricultural community 
Hidas. So, so, so uh, I think it's important that we work together on this, that whatever solution we provide, it worked for them and it worked for the country too. Um, and we're talking about um, transferring 20% of Poland kind of pastures into a forestation or bioenergy or the, these sort of things. We aren't talking about complete change to the way agriculture is done, but we're talking about re-incentivizing it to take alternatives. Okay, and, and that takes me on to my, my next question, agroforestry or, or, or forestry. What proportion of new woodland uh, should be coniferous uh, and uh, what proportion should be uh, broadleaf? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but what we haven't assumed is that, that we're just going to grow conifers. So there's, a, there's a, again, this is one of those areas where we could have gone, you know, uh, you know Frankly, the cheapest strategy of all would be just to build, you know, to build. Not let's not use that word, <laughs> city boy, uh, to plant lots of conifers. Um, I think we've been cautious and sensible about this. This being that there are other there are other things at play here, not least biodiversity, that need to be considered alongside this. I don't know if any of you have the um, stats. Yeah, have. in fact, it's a very interesting point you've raised there because this is really where we need the help of the research community. We know more about agroforestry probably in tropical countries than we do in this country. Um, a lot of the research in the country comes from the Forestry Commission and that relatively big plantations. So, so we don't have enough research on the wilding what it does for the soil carbon and things like that. In fact, and it is really probably dependent on what you plant in particular locations. You talk about trying to put your trees on the island of Lewis and things. The tree you plant there might be different than somewhere else. So, so, so it becomes a really challenging problem for the research community, which we do not currently have the, all the answers for. Okay, thanks. And, and sticking with wood, why is there only a, a presumption of a 10% increase in the use of wood in construction? Uh, and could you maybe lay out what the barriers are to increasing that number, that percentage? Um, that seems low, actually. I think we, said, I mean, we might have said more for Scotland, but, um, but uh, perhaps we can come back to that. I mean, the barriers are that, the you know, again, this has been a, a very deep piece of research that we did last year on biomass, where we looked at the questions of wooden construction in deep engagement with the construction sector. And I should say that the kind of scenarios that we have in here, which again are cautious, so that's a word I've been using a lot today, are, 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 are to many in the construction sector still very difficult to conceive of. Um, we have not seen that there are major barriers to using wooden construction, even for high-rise buildings, actually, and it's a very sensible use of that biomass resource. Um, I would love to see that, uh, see the kind of assessments we are making. Uh, I'd love to see that outperformed. That it seems to me is a very sensible use of, of Scottish biomass resource, and we have a lot of capacity to grow it here. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Ambition option assumes 40% of houses and flats are built with a timber frame, up from under 30% today. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to um, talking about uh, obstacles and costs because um, we have picked up on quite a lot of the other issues that we want to discuss along the way. Can I turn to Mark Ruskell to, to start us off in that direction, please? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of areas here. I mean, you, you know, we live in a fossil fuel economy. Um, you know, UK big oil and gas producer, fossil fuels are, are, are cheap. Um, I mean, can we continue to extract oil and gas at the current rates? Can we adopt a policy of maximum resource extraction and still meet a, a net zero target by 2045? So this is one of the most difficult areas for us. Um, the, the, the short answer to this is probably we can, but you need a set of things that aren't in place yet to deliver that. And, um, that, and clearly, you know, the kind of extractive industries that we have at the moment are clearly not compatible with a net zero future overall um, forevermore. Um, we in this report, just as David said earlier, have been focused, have focused on the question of can you get to net zero, and we've, been, we've, we've I think, very clearly nailed the, 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 the answer yes. In this report, again, using very cautious assessments, we do use a lot of fossil CCS, 
Um, but there are alternatives. At the moment, they look like more expensive alternatives, not least the, use, the greater and more extensive use of electricity. Um, our personal view is I would love to see that improve. So, you know, when, when we come to do our more detailed assessments over the next 12 months or so, I think we will look at some of the alternatives to that fossil CCS question. But we still need, for example, in that hydrogen fueled economy that we've talked about a few times in this discussion, it's likely that some, are, some, of, that, some of that will come from uh, natural gas, for example. Um, there are alternatives to that. They are more expensive alternatives. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't pursue them. So, yes, there is a world where we continue to extract oil and gas, but it cannot be a world where we, we burn that oil and gas unabated. And that is the key thing, really, is that, that, that again, one of those areas where we have to be extremely clear. I would love to see that, a, a much clearer strategy from government, what it intends to do about that overall. And some of the things we're seeing in the support, I'm sure, are, don't sit well with some of the campaigns, for example, with it from, from the NGOs. Um, I, and, and in the future, I hope we can look at more of the options around them. So what's your view then of countries like New Zealand that have said, you know, we're going to draw a line, uh, we're not going to go for more licensing and exploration licenses, or even Norway, who recently said they're not going to allow exploration in the Lofoten Islands. I mean, it, it does seem that countries are, are looking at the, 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 uh, the demand side, but they're also looking at the, the generation of fossil fuels and, and extraction of fossil fuels and saying, you know, we need to start transition now. Perhaps I can speak to that because I was a author of that IPCC report from last year. We did we did look at all possible path, well, a whole lot of path pathways that could get us to one and a half degrees. Uh, and as Chris said, there there is the clear option in those pathways. You, you either have the extraction industries continuing with huge amounts of carbon capture and storage accompanying them, or the alternative is you really rapidly phase out the extracting industries. So, 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 we'll, so we'll, we, have a, we have a range of pathways, and it, it and really they go between those two extremes. So you can, you can, you can either phase out the extracting industry as possible and replace with something else, or, or to, to, to tour, yeah. you have to increase your CCS at the same time. So, so there's, there isn't one perfect way. So, so in terms of your advice, where, where do you sit at the moment in, in terms of that? Is it just assuming we're going to continue current levels of extraction, or are you assuming a certain level of transition within that? Because otherwise we're taking a big risk on CCS being... So it's not clear in this report, um, one way or another, what we looked at is what's the feasible strategy overall that could get us there. And we have, as I mentioned before, we have we have a lot of fossil CCS in there. And then that, that probably amounts to a similar sort of size of industry. But there's a different approach to this that could also be assessed where, where, or could be taken. Um, you mentioned New Zealand. That's a choice, a political choice. It's one that gets us to that net zero target like any other. Our job in the committee is to try and avoid the political choices, but instead to give you the assessment of the implications of those choices when they're taken. That's, I think this is as good a report as any for that. Um, you know, again, a personal view, I'd love to see us go hard at some of the options that see a much, a much reduced use of fossil fuels in the future. At the moment, they look like more expensive options. And you know, we are required as the Committee on Climate Change by the Climate Change Act here in Scotland and at UK level to assess the cost effective path as best we can. On the oil and gas industry, so at, at current levels, if we were to move to a model where we did um, use hydrogen as, as a main fuel for, say, you know, heating and transport, and we used the feedstock from from natural gas that's uh, that's produced by by the North Sea and West of Shetland, the oil extraction as a feedstock for manufacturing would. Um, would that effectively mean that we're able to manufacture more here, this reducing the need to actually import as many goods, and that, that could actually have a, a knock-on effect in terms of us reaching net zero as well, you know, with all those options. So we've still got an oil and gas industry, but if we were to shut that down tomorrow, it could mean that we wouldn't have a feedstock for hydrogen, and we would have to import quite a lot of our goods from our, our, our feedstock for manufacturing and chemicals industry. Yes, that's I'm probably going. right. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. David, do you want to add anything? I think it's really important to recognise that 
if we don't produce the oil and gas here, but we still consume it, then it will need to be produced somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so the best thing we can do for the climate is to reduce the amount of fossil fuel that we consume in areas where we can do that. In some yeah. areas, we'll, we'll, we'll still need it. Um, and then the question of what we end up with in terms of fossil fuel consumption, whether that's produced in Scotland or whether that's produced elsewhere, is not a matter for the climate. It's a matter for how the economics play out. Um, we are rapidly running out of time. I just wanted to ask, um, in terms of the modelling that you carried out, did you look at the project, projected co-benefits, co for example, like those long-term benefits in terms of almost like a preventative spend on, on, on yeah. you know, carbon reduction versus, say, air quality and impacts yeah. on health, active travel, healthier diets? Did you model that? We did. So what we haven't done in this report is wash all that together with the costs overall. So we wanted to be completely transparent about the, re the reality that there is a cost in, a, in, in achieving net zero. Um, we assessed on a UK-wide basis that cost is between 1% and 2% of GDP. That's, um, that is our best assessment of something that's extremely difficult to assess. We also look at the co-benefits, not least of um, improved health and air quality. If you take the Treasury's Green Book, which is the basis on which investments can be appraised, and just roll forward some of those benefits, which are, you know, are more difficult to assess, it's worth saying, and, and, and to monetise, then you get to something that looks, in the report, we talk about 1.3% of GDP coming from benefits, just from those two things. It's a clue that doing all this is much more than just an exercise in addressing climate change. There are real benefits in, uh, in reducing emissions, especially that air quality question. And there are wider ones to biodiversity overall. The biggest benefit of all, of course, is avoiding the huge impact of climate change in the future. And, and that's why we haven't tried to you know, give a false prospectus here. There are real costs that do need to be managed with policy, but I expect the benefits to be enormous as well. Yeah, so basically the, the early action now is going to prevent the huge cost in the future of, of climate change. Just to say, you do have to get those early actions correct. That's why it's good you have a to just transition commission but, but, but because you 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 get the benefits for 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 provided you do things in the correct way yeah um, Claudia Beamish wanted to come in right uh, uh, thank you Vina. I was very pleased to hear you um, highlight the um, just transition commission in the context of um, the fossil fuel industry but I, I would um, uh, ask in terms of the extractive industries um, is there a place I hope there is but what place is there I'll rephrase that for the circular economy and remanufacturing of plastics and looking at that perspective rather than uh, talking about CCS um, not I don't mean rather than talking about it but as, as another consideration yes there is a place I'm afraid I don't have any stats in front of me that I can set that set that out but it, um, one of the things we do reflect on in the summary at the start is the importance of um, using and reusing um, the goods that we purchase and buying high quality goods in the first place. The circular economy is a broader set of things than, of course, than just climate change. But we, you know that we look at the waste question more actively in here and the emissions from waste, and that's one of the key ways in which you might see a reduction from that. Um, it's a harder thing, I think, for us to assess in terms of the overall emissions reduction that we that we that we've proposed. But again, it's one of the. I, I'll make this point that we need to throw everything at the net zero challenge, and that would include having a much more circular economy overall. David, is there anything you want to say about, you know, specifically how we've approached that challenge? Uh, only that, really, for the first time in our analysis this time, we, we've looked at the uh, potential for resource efficiency and, and what that can do for uh, reductions in emissions from the industry sector. So that's, we have taken our analysis forward there we, we have a new evidence base and we've, we've been relatively ambitious on that i'm sure there's more that we can do but but it is an area we've looked at and in particular we want to look at where are the bits of the economy that are still going to be hard to to fully decarbonize even by 2045 2050 and what can we do on the demand side so we have been looking more at that and i think it's an important area for further work as well Mark, would you like to finish up your yeah, question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you about infrastructure projects. Um, you know, we've seen recent Scottish budgets, government grading their infrastructure investments around high, medium, low carbon infrastructure. Do, do you believe that we should be aiming for a, a particular target? Because there's obviously a danger that if we build high carbon infrastructure, we're locking in 
emissions by design? I mean, not just for 10 years, but for 20, 30, 40, 50 years? I, I don't have a strong view, frankly, on how we, how we approach the infrastructure questions, except to say that we must approach them properly. So right. to get to net zero with the kind of costs that we've assessed is perfectly possible. And indeed, I would say those costs are relatively small and very manageable. But those costs will be much, much, much higher if we don't think about the turnover of capital stock that's necessary to deliver net zero. That means you know, transport and energy in particular, but also the housing stock. If at the end of this period we are scrapping capital assets with the costs that we need to incur to do that in a, you know, a market like this, this is going to be much more expensive than it needs to be. So I would like to see infrastructure provision uh, made here in Scotland and across the UK in light of the net zero target. Um, it's interesting that the National Infrastructure Commission UK-wide said something very similar uh, yesterday, I think it was, anyway, certainly this week that government needs to think in those kind of timescales to, to, to deliver the right outcome. Um, infrastructure is one of the, we, we have a whole section on the infrastructure requirements of net zero that it, it needs active thought and active planning or we won't get there uh, anywhere near the right cost. So what, to the, what does that actually mean then? Fewer road building projects or, or what? Yeah, road building projects, again, are, are one of those areas where it's not, it's not possible for us to be completely definitive on it because if we're all driving electric vehicles then it becomes, it becomes a, you know, a, a much lower carbon uh, infrastructure asset. I'm thinking less about road building and more about um, the energy questions. So the kind of dub so we're, when we're forecasting a doubling of electricity demand. Uh, that has a big infrastructure requirement. The biggest infrastructure requirement of all, the hardest one, is the housing stock. So how one approaches that. And I have to say that, that in Scotland there is a much better plan for that than there is UK wide. This idea of achieving something over, you know, ten or twenty years far more sensible, you know, where there's a clear goal in mind and a clear set of policies to deliver it. That's something I would love to see the rest of the UK adopt as well. I think the timing issue there, as you mentioned, Chris, is really important. As the, as the stock, the capital stock gets replaced and knowing what the lifetime of it is to, to make sure that that kind of low carbon consideration is built in at the beginning, if it's going to be there for 25 years or whatever, uh, you know, early asset write-off is not, not going to be helpful to think Carson wants to come in on that. Just a very, very quick question regarding obstacles and costs. How reliant uh, are, are your ambitions for 2045? Uh, how reliant are, are, they on, are, are they on behavioural change and actually taking the public with us? And what risks are, are, are involved around that? On a scale of 1 to 10, how important is behavioural change? I can do better than that. So hang on, if you bear with me, I'll, get, I'll tell you exactly what role behaviour change plays in their assessment because I have a, a, a handy pie chart that I will now bring up on my iPad here. So we are relying on um, a mixture of um, technological change and behavioural change to achieve net zero. Um, I suppose the key message here is that we're not going to achieve this overall unless we engage people properly in this challenge. 38% um, it will be achieved through low carbon technologies. Um, at nine percent is largely societal and behaviour change, and the rest is a combination of those two things. Now, th that is this is clearly an art rather than a science, but it gives you a sense of the proportions overall. Thank you. So coming back to the costs and the cost benefits of doing all this work over the next couple of decades, you think the Treasury of you should be looking at that now? Absolutely. So we very carefully gave the recommendation to Treasury that they should review this. I hope it's, I hope it's a, a recommendation they accept. I don't know whether they will or not, I should say, but um, I hope that it is something they accept. Um, I might say that I don't think we will make much further progress if the answer to decarbonising the whole economy is simply to lump more costs into the electricity bill. So there is a real need to look at this properly. The key outcome at the end of this is that we need, uh, uh, we need something that delivers net zero but in a way that isn't regressive, that is that it doesn't have damaging impacts to especially uh, vulnerable citizens, mm. but also doesn't impact regressively on competitiveness. So that's something I don't think has had nearly enough attention in policy terms. There are real reasons for the Treasury to look at this because they're going to start seeing some, some of those environmental taxes that have delivered very high revenues for a while, think of fuel duties for a while, fuel duty for example, won't be there in the future as we switch to 
electric vehicles. So the Treasury will have to think about this, if only to think about the revenue, the revenue issues overall. I'd love to see them approach this strategically as they once did, for example, with the Stern Review. So the next Stern Review, which is the, still the kind of basis in the economics of a lot of the work that we do, was a Treasury Commission document 12 years ago. Um, they, at that point, viewed it as a big strategic challenge and an economics challenge, and I think now is the moment for them to re-engage with it on that basis too. I am optimistic if they do so, then, then this whole thing can be managed in a way that is not regressive and doesn't impact on competitiveness, but that does require proper thought. And it's going to take a political will to look beyond an election cycle. Absolutely. And again, the Treasury in the past has been very good at doing those things. It, it generally does take the long view on the, on the, on the UK economy. Um, if we don't take a long view on it, then it will not be a successful transition overall. And Piers's earlier point about the just transition being so important to this is is really really important thing. That's part of, that was the kind of second part of our recommendation to Treasuries that we think about, of course, the fiscal issues and the big strategic issues, but also the regional impacts and the impacts on vulnerable communities alongside that. Okay. Um, move on to questions about your response to the Scottish government's response to your report, Mark Ruskell. Um, I mean, it's obviously early days because we're not fully into stage two at this point, but I, I wondered if you had any reflections then on, on the early response to, uh, to your report from the Scottish Government. Well, I, I mean, I'm delighted that, um, that a recommendation was accepted so early. I think it was accepted at two minutes past, two minutes past midnight or something. So, I mean, I, I, we'll allow them 60 seconds. Um, uh, I, I think it's wonderful. I mean, in many ways, of course, the Scottish Government had to respond quickly given the stage of the bill. But it, it matters immensely that they chose to accept this recommendation as quickly as they did because it, may, it now gives a much better platform for the rest of the UK to follow. And it's much clearer now that we need to not stop, we need to stop talking about targets and start talking about how we deliver those things. So that, to my mind, has been fantastic in Scotland. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic signal, absolutely. And, and it highlights some of the things that we've talked about already this morning, you know, some of the, yeah, the, the action that's, that's needed. The interdependency with other action, I mean, that's a kind of a, a thing to be considered, I guess, is the fact that a meeting the, the proposed and you know, recommended target for Scotland does depend on action UK-wide. It's the other way around as well. UK-wide depends on action in, within Scotland. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, just to, to get on with it, basically. Another thing is you know, the interim, you know, what, what, what's the kind of, how do you prioritise action in the short term? You've asked some very fair questions about that. As, as, as we've said, you know, this will aim to inform some of that, but some of these things are, are political choices as well that we've also, what, what also talked about. What can you do to inform that critical 2030 target ahead of stage two? Is there more work that you can supply this committee in order? No, I don't think so. Uh, we, have, we have stretched so to the... a political the choice then at the end of the day. Well, I, there is always political choice, but what to set that target at? But we haven't got a basis in which to offer a more comprehensive assessment of that that target yet. And I'm, you know, again, I'll, I'm sorry about that, but that's that's it does rely on a set of things that we haven't got the evidence yet for. Yeah, I think I would s s say that we really did push everything almost to kind of far as they could go in a certain way. So, so, so. I do think if we were to go back and do some revised modelling, and that we we did that through the six months of producing it, we went back over them time and time again, and things changed by one or two percent. But because it, it's we're we're really asking these calculations to do everything, so they really don't change in a huge way. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of just meeting that, that 2045 target that's been adopted now by government, what chance does that give us? of keeping the world below 1.5 degrees. Piers? Okay. okay. Um, well, I think it sets a really good chance but, but because things are really poised internationally now quite well. And I think if Scotland is a really, de really developed economy, it'll be the first country to set such a strong target, uh, things are carefully poised in EU countries, so I think the EU, the EU adopting a net zero 2050 target becomes, becomes more credible at that point, uh, uh, and I think when the EU adopts a target, other countries will also fall into place. And, and I think the, the UK wants to hold the next COP meeting in 20, 
20, and what a better place to do it than Edinburgh or yeah. Glasgow, perhaps. So I think the opportunity there to set a target for the rest of the world to come after yeah. you would be good. I read somewhere it gives us a 50-50 chance of meeting 1.5. Yeah. Is that right? Across the world. And if coupled with those kind of ambitious near-term reductions, then that would deliver a greater than 50% chance of limiting temperature increase That's to one and a half degrees. That's still quite a big gamble. We um, don't have pathways that deliver much more than that. That's that you know this is the, so we are drawing on the best evidence that we can. So this is not this is not us kind of conceding and throwing in the towel. This is as good as we can give it, um, and this is um, as ambitious as we feel we can be at the moment. But there are big risks. Well, there are of course, and you'd expect yeah. the committee. I to I mean, be the, the IPCC that. said we should we should prevent every bit of warming possible. So as soon as warming goes up, which it will do from today, those risks go up. Mm. So so that is. That is why it's important to set the most ambitious targets. Um, Stuart Stevenson, I just thought I'd like to put a little early bid for Aberdeen to host COP2020. I think that would send a really good signal, but uh, my colleague. Well, I, I was just going to make the almost frivolous comment. The, the Copenhagen COP, which I think was 15, if I recall, there were 45,000 people at it. Isn't it time the cops started using video conferencing rather than transporting people all around the world? Yes. <laughs> it's an enormous thing. I mean, it's a mini Olympics. I mean, that, that yeah. was, a, I have to say that that was one of the, that was, it, it, it'd be a much bigger cop were we to host it in 2020. And I would make a bid for Glasgow to host it, given that's a good Glaswegian. Thank you, Vina. I wanted to go back to the 2030 targets. Um, and uh, we weren't sure there'd be the opportunity, uh, the time to ask this question. So um, I was very pleased to see that the CCC acknowledges um, the UK's um, historic um, climate debt. And has equity been, or will it be, factored into the 2030 interim targets, um, as well as into the 2045 net zero targets? And if so, how? So again, when we come to make a more detailed assessment in light of the better information that we have at UK, um, we, will, we will boil up a number of things, including that. I'm sure we'll look at the equity considerations too. Right. Um, I would, I'd like to again come back to, we've, we've talked about um, the various opportunities in developing the technology and um, the just transition to different different sectors um, moving into a, a kind of carbon uh, neutral economy what what do you think that both governments can do to ensure that all the the opportunities that come for for work and industry around this stay in the countries that are making this initial uh, I suppose taking on the, the challenges early as, as Scotland is as, as UK may do it's really hard for us to give a you know, a, a quick answer to that question, except to say that it's very important that this, those strategies are made. So, I mean, if we, I suppose what we could, what we could do is kind of lurch into this set a target and then, you know, have some policies that get us some of the way in the short term and just hope that they'll be there in the long term. The, that won't be an effective strategy overall and it will, it will damage the overall task of reducing emissions if we have that kind of strategy. What we need is a set of long-term strategies for the whole economy that include strategies for growth and strategies for jobs that are compatible with net zero. I mean, I might just add my own personal reflection on the story of renewables in Scotland, is that if we'd been as ambitious as we are now being about, about the growth of the offshore renewables sector, um, and indeed onshore renewables sector, now, if we'd been that ambitious 10, 15 years ago, we would have developed more of a homespun industry for those sectors. Um, some of it we still wouldn't have developed. I have to say that the UK and Scotland has been very good at capturing the high value bits of those sectors, and that's not an oft, oft, that's not an oft discussed topic, but we've been pretty good at it, but we could have had more. Mm -hmm. And I think the most successful strategies are the ones that bring everyone along with them. Uh, so I would love us to think about net zero, not just as a, a challenge of emissions reduction and not even just as a kind of whole economy question, but also a question of how you build the right jobs and uh, skills to achieve it. Yeah. B before we um, go into a, a, a brief pause, I, I would like to ask, we've, we've asked a lot of questions. Is there anything that, that our panel thinks that you we haven't covered that you would like to mention? Any final points you want to make? We've got a good seven minutes for you to do so. I, I just kind of want to make this point that, that, that some of the 
I did refer to this earlier, some of the coverage since we report, we, we haven't been fighting with Nigel Lawson. We've instead been having a discussion with, um, with a, a good discussion with Extinction Rebellion. And that, to me, is a remarkable bit of progress overall, demonstrating that we, have, we are discussing climate change in a way that we weren't 20 years ago, for example. I think there is now a broad consensus that this thing needs to be fixed and needs to be focused upon. But the parallel point is that although the discussion that we've been having has been good since we published this, there is, I think, still a, a feeling that we can do something um, even quicker. And I would love to see that happen, but I would also love to see us focus on the credible strategy to do that, because we are talking about a set of, um, in many cases, physical barriers to doing it sooner that we shouldn't lurch into and consider that we can just put a policy in place to deliver unless we've thought through carefully the implications of it. This report is as ambitious as we have ever been in the committee and does give us a platform to, 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 to say quite credibly that we are amongst the most ambitious countries in the world when it comes to emissions reduction. It may be in the future that we can bring forward that date, but at the moment, the evidence does not support that. So I, I just kind of wanted to make this point that this I, I, occasionally I've seen this described as an unambitious strategy. And I think that is it's so far off, so far off that, um, you know, I wanted to have it on the record here. This is this would be a huge statement um, were we to deliver it globally. Um, the Scottish government has done, I think, the right thing by setting the 2045 target in the bill already. Um, when the UK does the same, we will be in a remarkable position, um, but the task of delivering that is enormous. The kind of transition required we have never been able, we have never successfully achieved ever. So the policies to deliver that are not in place at the moment. So we'll need a kind of different sort of integrated discussion between the UK and Scottish governments to deliver that, which isn't there at the moment. Okay. I think that point about integrated discussion. I think well, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm interested in the system working and the elements of the system working. We have to get much better at understanding the interactions between them and the detailed engineering challenges. And, and uh, we, I think the way we're tackling that at the moment uh, as, as a nation is a bit sort of piecemeal, really. So I think we need to get much more serious about, about some of those things. And a system level perspective includes understanding how uh, the, the, the different investments might happen and how they're influenced by the policy levers, such as you know, the market mechanisms or regulations or whatever. So. We've not managed to, we're very slow at kind of making progress and understanding those things at a system level. And we really have to do that, I think. And, and uh, you know, as an example, you know, off gem, any changes there. They're only thinking generally in silos about electricity or gas and very rarely the interactions between them and any change just takes, seem to take f forever. So uh, I haven't got to kind of, unfortunately, I haven't got to kind of magic wand I can wave and speed all that up. But it means I've got to take all those things much more seriously. The same departments yeah. as well. I think it's so. Huge yeah. I mean, the Scottish government has a more integrated approach generally because it doesn't have the white hole system. So, but you know, the, the the silos are still there in the Scottish government. I can say from bitter experience. <laughs> so, I, I I do think there is a more integ integrated discussion in Scotland of some of the things that need to be done. I mean, in my former role as director of energy and climate change in the Scottish government, I was able to make housing policy. That's an amazing thing to be able to do. You wouldn't find that in Whitehall. So I do not underestimate the governance challenges overall. That's not something we've tried to deliberately draw out in the report, but it's definitely an inference you can draw from all of this, that mm -hmm. to achieve net zero requires a level of integration at every level of government and between the departments of government that does not exist at the moment. So we, when we do say in the report that net zero needs to be amongst the top priorities right the way through the departments that have the key levers, and at the moment it isn't. So it will not be achieved if this is only a you know a kind of second order priority in Bayes, for example. Good as the stuff that's been coming out of Bayes is, this has to be given a much more prominent role overall in the government's mission. If I could ask Chris a question, is that allowed? No, well, could I, I, I was gonna, are you going to come in? Um, could I just say that it doesn't just involve the government integration. We have to get better at really taking it out of the community. A lot of these things we talk about now are yeah. talking about the agricultural community or talking about particular towns and cities of the UK and even kind of palaces and villages and households. So, 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 so we have to get better at really integrating across those and really communicating the opportunities across all the different levels of community. It's not just a role for central government. Yeah. Uh, and the last thing, the opportunities internationally as well, which I talked about before, 
before. So I think by adopting a so adopting a clear target is one thing to do, but but really setting up the ambition to really bring these early opportunities now is what we have to do. I'm really it's interested to hear what Keith Bell's, Bell's question is. <laughs> that's good. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, Keith Bell, you, I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask your question. I was thinking, because well, you're running out of time, I thought it's clear to say, oh, I was just wondering whether these departments have kind of got the, the support behind them, actually, in terms of the analytical capability and the expertise. No, I, d I don't think they do. I mean, it's such an easy thing for me to sit here and say that they don't. But, but I think one of the great services that the Committee on Climate Change office, offers is that integrated view. Um, but it won't, I mean, it's, it is not, it is frankly not acceptable that we are the only bit that can offer that integrated view at the moment. So I, I would love to see government invest in the kind of analytical underpinning that will deliver net zero. That means we have to be much more conscious about knock-on impacts of decisions in one bit of Whitehall versus another, for example. Um, and there needs to be, um, there needs to be some force at the middle that coordinates this properly. Um, that doesn't need to be Treasury or Number Ten. It does need, but it does need to be someone that has an interest in each each bit of government and each layer of government, uh, and how those things cooperate. None of this is achievable unless there's a fully fledged strategy here in Scotland and a fully fledged strategy in Whitehall that works with it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I am very optimistic about the ability to do that and to bring that together. But it does require everyone, civic society and government, to focus on the goal overall. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all very much for your time this morning. I'm going to suspend this meeting briefly um, to allow us to go into private session. Thank you.
back. Um, the second item on our agenda this morning is to consider the committee's draft annual report for 2018-2019. Um, so members have had a, a good look at it. Are there any comments on it or issues? Stuart. Uh, it, it's a very minor one, which I hope I'm not speaking out of order. I think my colleague next to me agrees. Um, just the, 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 the photograph um, we're not very keen on the, either the colour or intensity of the hue of the background of the oh, I've, I've the only, team I've only photograph. looked at mine in black and white, so which, which the team photograph? Um, yeah. it, it's on page one. So okay, on page so we'll one. adjust Immediately that. Immediately under... I mean, I'm not going to direct... Is it not getting your skin tone correct? Well, my, uh, I, I think it's just a very intense background right, okay. of a colour that isn't terribly friendly to figures. Okay, so we'll adjust that. Um, it's something like, something like a Star Trek or something like that, I would suggest. It's a is that not quite cool? <laughs> anyway, the, 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 I had a comment Star about Trek. the just about the, the evidence, the people who gave us evidence, that one of the things that I think it's important to do is to look at the, the gender breakdown. Um, so that's something that we, we can do just to sort of, you know, we, we want this drive to have 50-50 parity. We, ha we are improving on it year on year. I think it's important to be upfront about where we are on that. And I know that Mark, you had some comments on that yeah. too. I agree with you, Convener. I think you know we reported on this last year, so it'll be good. I know we've done some work to um, contact witnesses um, who've given evidence to committee to incorporate their feedback as well about yeah. how sessions are run. So, um, so yeah, I think it'd be good to report on it again this year. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Uh, is the committee content with me to sign off on the final version of the report with the adjustments that we've just said? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. So that concludes the committee's business in public today. Its next meeting on the 15th of May is tomorrow, and the committee will be taking evidence via video link from uh, Right Honourable Michael Gove, MP, Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and as agreed, we'll move into private session now, and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now closed. We'll have a suspension. Thank you. <laughs>